Have you ever been knocked down and found it hard to get up? Have you ever been knocked down and bounced back to come back even stronger? Hi, I'm Gaurav Bhagat and you can call me GB and welcome to the Smash Bashed Yet Not Dashed podcast. A fortnightly podcast where I speak about persistence, perseverance and overcoming the odds to come out ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Smashed Bashed Yet Not Dashed podcast. Today's guest is exceptional, not only because he was born in the same city as me, not only because he went to the same school as me, but because he's one of the most, well, the most gifted people I've ever met. In fact, so gifted that whatever path he has chosen to walk, he's excelled at it. Forbes magazine calls him the global face of Indian comedy. And the Huffington Post called him a world-class comedian and spell-binding storyteller. Welcome to the podcast, Papa CJ. Gaurav, what have you done? You have raised expectations too high with this introduction. The secret is to set the bar really low and then disappoint. <laughs> right, right. Just learning the ropes as we go along. And of course, I'm still <laughs> new to this space, so not as accomplished as you in terms of holding audience. And yep, as you said, you know, setting the context but hey dude great to have you here and it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast thanks man thanks a lot it's lovely to be here so it's been a while i mean i was just thinking about the last time we met and i think it was at a show at shreefort and you had everyone in splits as you always do so first up um, how have you been my friend very good yeah no complaints i think in uh, today's day and age if you have your health on your side and your family with you you can not be anything else but grateful so i am incredibly grateful and happy to be here. Lovely. And also, first up, I must say, exceptional work on your book, Naked. I mean, everyone who's listening in or watching this episode, you must get that book. And if you're from Calcutta or a boarding school kid, okay, then you must do it before the day is out. So exceptional work on Naked, just by the way. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I've never, I've never thought of myself as an author. And um, given we went to the same school, uh, I don't think we were really known for being particularly literate. <laughs> but uh, it just randomly came about. I mean, the, the book is based on a show. So I used to tour the show called Naked. And then some publisher showed up and said there should be a book. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, if you say so, sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, since you've read the book, you'll know that if you were, uh, when you read it, it'll feel like I'm sitting next to you at a bar and just telling you the story. 100%. You know, I don't, uh, I'm not Shashi Tharoor. I don't know any words for which you would need a dictionary. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you, uh, you enjoyed it. Oh, exceptional. Like I said, no, completely, completely um, connected. And I was just thinking, in fact, uh, Naked should be compulsory reading for all scenarios. I was going to say present too, but uh, probably not, because I think you'll give them some really notorious ideas and maybe that's not a great idea. But <laughs> again, like I said, I mean, exceptional. And you, you're quite a prankster. Right? I never really thought um, that was you. But yeah, once I was going through that book, I'm like, oh, my God, like really and how? Yeah, boarding school, here's the thing, right? Because you know exactly what it's like. You learn very soon that if you do something wrong and you get caught, you will get a hammering. I mean, nowadays they don't get hammerings. You know, there's probably some form of formal discipline where you're not physically getting beaten up. So either you don't do anything wrong or you learn how to not get caught. Yeah. But in those days when we were growing up, it was understood that if you do get caught, you will get a thrashing. And I think the upside is that we weren't particularly singled out. Everybody yeah. got it, yeah. you know. So I suppose it was just a rites of passage in those days. But yeah, in today's day and age, that would be called child cruelty 100%. or abuse. Time, times, have, times have changed and, and how. So, I mean, yeah. if people hear about what we went through, they'll be like, oh my God, is that even like legal? But I yeah. guess it isn't. But in those days, wow, people really got, got away with a lot of things. So yeah. 100%. So, Calcutta boy growing up in, well, Bengal in the 80s, how was that for you? So, taking you way back to where the journey all began. I think it was wonderful. Yeah. You know, the beauty about Calcutta is the warmth of the people. You know, today I've, I've been living in Delhi for the last 12 years. And I remember initially when I came to Delhi, for me, it felt like everybody here was either into business or into politics. So, they're either kissing somebody's ass or they're kicking somebody's ass. So when they meet you, they try and figure out where you are on that spectrum. Yeah. Whereas Calcutta in many ways was 
a little bit like boarding school you know nobody you never knew whose father did what and everybody's father worked for some company or the other you met them at the clubs you all ate the same food you all played the same sport and maybe it's because <laughs> work is not really a priority in calcutta but people have time for you you know it was not the kind of i mean today we live in an age where you have to message somebody before you call them right. but in those days you just dropped into somebody's house you know you could just show up unannounced and vice versa and it it wasn't an unwelcome thing yeah 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 100% i think calcutta is definitely one of my favorite cities i keep going back there uh, a lot and i see uh, even from the book that you have fond memories of nizams and you know eating kathis in the car and all of that oh yeah so yeah right so passage uh, you know even for us uh, growing up so it's so good to hear so of course like i said people have to read the book because i mean how you know how you describe calcutta um, you know and 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 the life in terms of how you grew up really really cool so moving forward okay one of the smartest kids in school and you were right so you don't need to be modest there on this pristine hill top called sana and i think the first time that i heard about you when i was in the 6th grade and i heard that a monkey hit attack attacked you and rambo was out with his gun to take revenge uh, did that <laughs> happen because i recall yeah, this from the first it did happen it did yeah. happen i was 10 years old i was carrying a packet of chips and there was this and this is in prep school in the junior school in that space on the quad in front of the dormitory and i was walking towards the assembly hall and this big fat monkey came towards me so my choices were give him the chips or hold on to it because it's grub it's food in boarding school which is like gold yes. like a fool i decided i would hold on to it so he came and sunk his teeth into my ass and uh, i had to get stitches and then they had to decide whether or not to give me injections because i think you had i don't remember what shots you required right. unless you found out that the monkey was okay so our uh, matron was mrs ram singh mm-hmm. her son actually shot the monkey wow. and uh, uh, and then luckily i didn't need any shots for i don't know rabies or whatever it was at that time but yeah i did uh, i did get a monkey bite on my ass and maybe maybe that's where the humor comes from <laughs> <laughs> legend yeah i i like i like to say that was one of the first memories and we were like oh my god there's like a killer monkey on the loose and of course rambo was <laughs> also mr ramchandani who was our uh, our headmaster in school at the time and yeah so apparently the whole rumor was that yes he went out with a gun but hey thanks for clarifying that he actually did uh, you know avenge the bite so yeah awesome <laughs> So Sanaa really was a crazy place right but I mean you managed to excel in everything uh, I mean, of course I was reading I knew you were really really smart because you probably and I think you mentioned in your book as well I think barring 11th grade you pretty much topped you know every year in academics with the exception of the 11th grade like you mentioned so academic excellence did that come naturally to you you know I was always a I was always was being the keyword uh, I was always an intelligent kid but i wasn't a hard working kid and also all through uh, my schooling days i mean my my dad used to tell me about this later i like to win you know if i did something i wanted to be the best at it but that didn't mean that i was passionate about it mm-hmm. it wasn't necessarily an interest mm-hmm. i just wanted to be the best you know yeah. so had there been people with an even higher standard around me i would probably have been even better at things but that doesn't mean i was necessarily uh, i've lost my train of thought but yeah so essentially i wasn't necessarily passionate about it okay. so if i went to class uh, i wanted to come first i mean in school i played i was on every school team cricket football hockey i mean dramatic school band etc right but it was not necessarily a passion you know it is only much later in life that um, i discovered stand up comedy and the, at the age of 28 i found something that i was genuinely passionate about right uh, and also just to clarify in class 11 i went on exchange to canada i was not eligible to come first in class <laughs> yes yes i do recall that as well but awesome and it's not only the study piece uh, even if you take a look at athletics i think rahul rishi and you you guys were like crushing every possible you know long distance record that was there and then i find out that you're also like uh, you're sprinting the 200 and you're like crushing that as well that's exceptional talent because i mean to be a long distance runner you're a long distance runner but then to be you know also excelling in like the 200 and the 400 so very very different skill set compared to the 3000 meters you know it's quite funny now i try and run and i realize how out of shape i am 
because in those days i used to do 3000 meters so 3 kilometers in under 10 and a half seconds at uh, 10 and a half minutes yeah. but i also used to do 100 meters in 12 seconds so, uh, and i think in those days i mean you know the kind of coaches we had in school we didn't really had have coaches who taught us skill sure. so you, <laughs> we got on most teams purely on you know stamina and fitness and and speed i suppose 100% yeah and like i said that it's it's an exceptional skill set i mean just to be a long distance runner and uh, you know a sprinter and also make all the teams so well done nah, this just got to stop being so nice to me my my head is not going to fit in through this door <laughs> okay so fondest memories uh, going back to snow so just a couple of things that really really stand out for you when you look back and you say hey that was that was cool you know one of the fondest memories is actually one that i had forgotten for almost 30 years you know it's one that i've written about in my book mm-hmm. which i read a housemaster mr anand uh, had posted about this on facebook and suddenly it showed up that on diwali he had a firecracker that burst on his hand and his mm-hmm. hand had got badly burnt there were no doctors around so i happened to be at his house and heard his wife in the background talking about how they needed vegetables how he needed some medicines and nothing could be done until the next day because it was diwali he was badly hurt he was in a lot of pain and while they were not looking i picked up that list of medicines from uh, his dining table i sneaked out of school i got the chemist to open the shop i bought the medicines i bought the vegetables and i came back to his house and i gave it to him and he said he was t- he was holding back tears because on one side as the house master he he couldn't sort of ratify me breaking bounds and getting out of school but then there was this kid who had gone and done this and i think for me that was very special to me because i i mean i was talking to my my cousin literally 10 minutes ago mm-hmm. and telling her that you know nowadays i find that what's called what what are traditionally called achievements uh i don't really hold them in any high regard whatsoever but if somebody can think of you as being kind or compassionate or having touched their lives in a way and it doesn't have to be in a, in any level of magnitude you know i don't need to run a charity and you know sort of serve 100000 lives mm-hmm. but if you can touch people's lives in a positive way i mean for me the the characteristics that i admire the most in another human being are kindness compassion and humility awesome. and i think if if somebody can think of you under any of those characteristics then that is is an achievement enough so for me that is one of my fondest memories that comes to mind right now true that and thank you for sharing and so so agree i think the world truly can do with you know just more compassion kindness and and genuineness which is just just gone you know from a lot of people's dictionaries so thank you for sharing on that one so what do you think it is with um, you know scenarians uh, mr abraham and comedy because uh, another of your contemporaries and this would be veer also has yeah. all three things uh, you know in common so i mean what is yeah. it with mr abraham sana and and comedy and you know what would you think that would be <laughs> you know they say that <laughs> true comedy comes out of tragedy and pain <laughs> you know comedy is pain plus distance where distance could either be time or geography or you know a psychological mindset mm-hmm. but i think as comedians we are truly blessed because every human being on the planet goes through some form of pain or some form of suffering we are too truly blessed and i say that because even today when i'm suffering or going through something yes. while i'm suffering it i'm thinking to myself this is terrible right now but in 6 months time it's going to be fantastic on stage mm-hmm. so we are able to channelize our pain into art or into humor and not only is that cathartic for us and for other people but it kind of helps us deal with it in the moment as well you know so i think that's uh, that's a real blessing to have mm. to be able to view your pain through the lens of humor because we're all going to get it i mean you might as well uh, get something positive out of it yeah agree that and um, so you know of course this is called the smash bash you no know, yet not dashed uh, podcast and before getting some of those moments uh, you know in your life 
I also want to ask you about, um, and you mentioned this in your book, setting up certain expectations, you know, having certain expectations, and then facing monumental disappointments. And going back to maybe even, and I know you've had your fair share, but going back to maybe even Founders Day of 1994. Right, where you had set yourself yeah. up and you said, "Hey, this is what I want to do." You're leading the school, leading the parade, and then yeah. the parade happens, and the you know the founders gets cancelled. So again, yeah. you know, setting yourself up for something that you always wanted, and then just having to face uh, monumental disappointment. I think it's one of the everybody goes through it. You know, no matter what level it is at, you know, whether it's at a personal level or a professional level or some massive scale or somebody you have a crush on who doesn't you know uh, oblige or like you back Mm -hmm. but I think over the course of time you you learn how to deal with it right and it's not that you lose hope but you're like yeah I'm going to give it a go and if it doesn't work out that's fine you know I gave it my best and uh, I'll move on to the next thing or I'll try it again you know I remember in uh, in business school we used to apply for uh, for jobs now when you got a rejection letter now you could either be upset about it right but what we did was, in our, in our circle of friends, we decided whenever you got a rejection letter, the others would buy you a beer. Mm-hmm. And we used to call them PFO letters. And you know what the FO stands mm-hmm. for. But P stood for please. You know, these polite letters. Oh, we had a highly skilled applicant pool. We always was a lovely resume. But it just, didn't, you know, one of those things. But then you just move on. I mean, the second I got a rejection letter from a company, I would reapply to them. Right. You know, some of them on the second chance called you for an interview. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, I think it's, um, you just learn how to roll with the punches there. Yeah. True that, true that. Yeah, and never given truly has been a motto, right? So, yeah. And um, now you're in the UK, uh, you're in, on a sabbatical and you attend the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and you're smitten. Um, so talk us about that because that's truly where the journey in comedy began, right? See, I was in a dull corporate job. You know, I was in an IT company. I was not an IT guy. I didn't understand half the stuff they were talking about. I joined in the year 2000 when this whole dot-com crash and stuff happened. I wasn't really getting placed on projects. So all these, you know, I joined as a young 23-year-old with, you know, these dreams of corporate success Mm -hmm. and it went nowhere. So I was miserable at work. Mm -hmm. And then I take this sabbatical and I go to the Edinburgh Festival and I see these guys doing stand-up comedy. It's the most amazing thing I had ever seen. I mean, here was a guy on stage. He had a beer in one hand, a microphone in the other, and he's just having fun. And that's supposedly his job. You know, I just couldn't think of something uh, that could be more amazing to do. So, I mean, of course, I had no clue whether I would have any talent at it whatsoever. And when you start, nobody really has any talent. But uh, I just decided to jump in head first and... uh, Ended up doing 700 gigs in three years. Uh, and of course, there's, I mean, there's, you've read the book. There's lots of stories within that. Sure that. Uh, but yeah, that's what, uh, that's what got me going. Right. Yeah. And of course, you start out like most people would, right? You joined a course. You didn't really care for that too much. And then you decided yeah. that to be the best, you have to hang out with the best. So how did you really do that? How did you get access to some of those people? How did you get them to you know, let you hang out with them, uh, so to speak? I don't know if it's necessarily called hanging out. But of the 700 gigs, 400 of them must have been out of London. Now, because I had a corporate job, uh, as you know, I didn't have a car at that time. So Mm. what used to happen was the headliner and the opening act were experienced acts. And the middle spot or the baby spot, as they call it, would be somebody like myself. So you would do five minutes or 10 minutes. And the reason you were taken, so I would... This gig would be four hours out of London, mm-hmm. you know, on average. Mm-hmm. So you drive all the way there, you do this gig, and you're paying your share of the petrol, right? You're not getting paid for any of these gigs. Right. And you do your five minutes or your 10 minutes or whatever. Right. But I have spent over 2,000 hours in cars with two fellow comedians who have been doing stand-up comedy for between 10 and 20 years. Wow. I would see how they prepared their shows. I would beg them to please watch my set and give me feedback. Mm -hmm. I would listen to their feedback. I would see how they analyze their own work after the show. If I struggled on stage with holding a certain audience, I would see how they went up and then dealt with exactly that audience. So just that, I mean, that was comedy university for me, you know. 
so i don't think there's a substitute for that but it wasn't necessarily the most pleasant uh, experience you know you were getting dropped off in the outskirts of london at 2 in the morning taking two and a half hours changing three different buses to get home wow. so it was tough but uh, invaluable of course of course exceptional and and truly putting in a lot of hard work and i think you also referred to yourself at that time as perhaps being the hardest working comedian in all of the uk and i see it because if you for a 5 minute gig 400 uh, you know um, outside london and having to travel and put in the hours that you did like wow but well, you know gorav i think i was slightly blessed because i was ignorant i had no idea how difficult it was to succeed in that profession how low the odds were i mean had i known maybe i wouldn't have you know gone that far but i didn't and i just loved it so i just kept going lovely yeah and of course uh, you know the world is a happier and a better place for it so lovely now tell me in comedy you've obviously had a lot of smash bashed moments uh, many highs many lows and i'm sure listeners would love to hear about some of those uh, from yourself so any that you'd like to share in particular so the highs now you could you could quote the textbook highs so i've performed to a full house at the sydney opera house uh, i've performed on broadway i've been at those massive stages in vegas mm-hmm. but for me the highs were some of the shows i did with my happiness project you know so pre covid uh, i offered for free completely to visit the hospital rooms and the homes uh, of people who had been unwell for a long time i did shows for cancer patients uh, i've been in the room of you know somebody who's an 80 plus old woman who's had her leg, her leg amputated goes for dialysis three times a week i think those were some of the most rewarding shows for me you know i remember there was a lady uh, in noida and when the show finished i told her i said auntie the show is not for free i lied every morning from tomorrow i need to receive a laughing photograph of yours after three days her son sends me a message saying you know you have increased her life span Okay. now when i send you her photograph before i send it she wants to look at it to make sure she is looking nice yeah. so good yeah i think that is that is more valuable than all the money in the world all right thank you for that share and um, truly exceptional high how about some lows anything that you want to talk about on that side as well i think the lows are uh, the interesting thing is you know i come from a very sort of textbook indian family my father worked for one tea company for 35 years i haven't come from a creative background so i was unprepared for understanding the i don't say uh, the energy cycle or the cycle of the life of being an artist right a self employed artist right sometimes the money comes sometimes it doesn't sometimes the shows come sometimes they don't right. sometimes the creativity or inspiration comes sometimes it doesn't the way we grow is it's a very non linear growth path you know you struggle you struggle you struggle you struggle and while you're struggling you're really learning and you're really growing but you are suffering right because you're struggling and then you hit the sweet spot where you're like you know i know how this stuff works mm-hmm. right and you get on there and you nail every gig and you and you go through this beautiful phase where you're just milking it right you're 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 nailing every gig everything's going smooth but ironically you're not growing right because you've got lazy you're like i've got this so then you have to force yourself and motivate yourself to say you know what i need to struggle again i need to go back to ground zero fail 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 so i can create something new and then get to that happy space but at a higher level right and what's beautiful about this profession is that it is an incredible journey of self discovery yeah. you know we are uh, theoretically in i say theoretically because it can change depending on which country and the political climate theoretically in a profession that has no rules no boundaries no guidelines no social norms mm. so you have to ask yourself what is it that i value what is important to me what do i want to talk about you know initially obviously you you're trying to please the audience right. uh, then you want to be seen as edgy so you'll do stuff that may be controversial right. but eventually you don't even care about what the audience thinks yeah. you're like this is me this is my truth if you like it fine 
if you don't like it also fine you know your audience will find you and the beauty of that is that you become very authentic very truthful almost blunt but you get to a space of great uh, comfort in yeah. terms of just being comfortable in your own skin yeah. you know and that's a great place to operate from yeah interesting and uh, so naked is a show and almost everyone i speak to who's been for it says man i so connected with papa cj i mean and this is a big gamble right but um, and and i mean that because apart from the fact that you stripped down to your underwear you're also laying your soul bare to everyone in the room uh, was yeah. this one of the reasons why you actually went ahead and and did that because you perhaps thought you were getting too comfortable i mean what made you really go ahead I mean, and de- try this out i mean definitely when i started uh, when i wrote the show to start with uh by the way are you getting dis- disturbed by bird sounds that's okay yeah there is a little bit of uh, uh, you know some buzz in the background but that's cool don't worry about it okay because i have a pet parrot who's <laughs> probably wandering somewhere close by i can bring him in and he'll get part uh you sure let me just should i just get him out of the way he's really noisy so there's a few things with naked i mean when i first wrote the show i still remember the first time i tried it out it was two and a half hours long and one of my friends who came to watch it he said what are you doing man he said you're a comedian and there's 20 minutes of silence in that show like really serious intense stuff you know you can't do that mm-hmm. but i don't think why do i need to fit a box of a comedian right why does they necessarily have to be this is what you can do and this is what you can't do you know mm-hmm. if my audience is engaged and they're following that story i'm going to do it and the beautiful part is that the serious bits are actually what make naked the show that it is and the reason why so many people have connected with it is because i mean the book you 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 read it it's based on the show right. i'm using the vehicle of my life but i'm talking about the human experience mm. so everybody who's reading the book or watching the show at some point is thinking oh this is not his life this is my life i have been through similar emotions i have been through similar experiences so the kind of connect that an audience has with you at a personal and emotional level after that show is phenomenal they normally after a show people will come to you and say hey man great show really enjoyed that i mean unless of course it was a terrible gig but after this show they just want to hug you and what tends to happen is people watch this show and they say well if this guy can go through this kind of stuff and laugh through it and get on the other side why can't i do the same you know with my problems and i found that it has been incredibly cathartic uh, for people watching that show in fact let me ask you this as somebody uh, in your position as a motivational speaker as a leadership coach i use naked for leadership coaching as well awesome for somebody like yourself who has read the book what lessons would you pull out of it from a personal and professional level so interesting i think there were there were there were just so many in there right and like i said uh, you know because of shared history and all that could connect a lot of things but if i was to you know just take out some of the lessons i think one of them is when you've taken a stand um you just stick by that stand right and irrespective of the consequences you know you just follow all the way through so i think that was one you know big uh, leadership lesson uh, that was you know really uh, in there for me as well um i think one of the other things that really stood out is the fact that um, again i think you really stood by your beliefs and even if it meant you know rubbing people the wrong way and not being politically politically correct um and like you mentioned that right it's my way or the highway or you know i or i did it my way in a way when you said when you quote uh, sinatra as well so i think that is admirable i think there are too many people today in the world who just go with the wind and they flip flop and today they're one person and tomorrow they're another person and i think uh, that was one big take away from the book is that this is my belief and this is what i am sticking to and you could be anyone and it doesn't matter i'm not going to be changing that so that was one of my big big uh, you know things that really stood out for me in the book cool yeah. by the way for everyone listening this is how you get a professional to give you tips now i'm going to use this in my training i'm joking <laughs> <laughs> no, right so um tell me about haters and hecklers all right while relatively easy to handle you know while you're on stage because i'm sure you know you with all your experience you've actually you know 
gone ahead and done that really well. How do you handle them off stage, or maybe on you know social media, or when you bump into one of these guys? How do you handle uh, haters and hecklers off stage? Okay. okay, so hecklers on stage, no problem, uh, mm-hmm. because a heckler is still paying attention. You know, uh, now unlike music, which can run in the background, for comedy people need to shut up and listen. Mm-hmm. You know, when people come to an auditorium, they've come with the intention to listen. Sometimes you'll get thrown into a corporate show where people have come for an award or to catch up with their friends, and they're being told, "Shut up and listen to this guy." That's tough, right? But a heckler is throwing stuff at you that you can deal with. You know, right. in terms of off stage, one I don't really get too many haters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, you will get the odd person on the internet who's going to say stuff. But I think, like George Bernard Shaw said, uh, well, he said, "Never wrestle with a pig, you know, because you get dirty and the pig enjoys it." For that, what difference does it make to my life? What you have to say, your opinion matters. Does not make a difference to my life. I mean, if it's constructive criticism, if there's a point behind, I'll take it on board. See if I can learn from it. Mm. If you're just a dick, I mean, fuck you, man. <laughs> like your opinion, why well, I won't even respond. Yeah. yeah. Why should I give your opinion? that much importance to even respond to it true true you know yeah yeah best to let go agree on that yeah so, writing content for a show or you know a gig um, how hard is that even for a brilliant guy like you how hard is you know actually putting together that content i find that it it's easier to do it last minute so for example now i live we live in an age where there's online shows taking place right yeah. my competition today is netflix Mm. but right. why should a corporate hire me when somebody can turn on netflix and the answer to that is two things one is interactivity because i can interact with the audience that is online mm-hmm. and there's a way i do it and the second is customization mm-hmm. so my show is built entirely around my audience right if i'm doing a show for school teachers i will talk to 25 school teachers the, the day before i will find out about everything that is happening in their lives and create a show around you if it's around your company so a lot of what i do is very customized but also what happens is god of that a client will come to me for one thing and walk away taking a lot of other things away i'll give you an example i had a firm that came to me and said cj can you do a 30 minute comedy show for us mm-hmm. so i asked them i said what are you doing what's the event they said oh it's a four day partners conference i said four days of people looking at the screen they're going to get bored like sure. yeah that's true what do you do what do we do I said why don't you let me host it you know I can be the glue that sticks between every session they agreed to let me do that yeah. I spent 12 hours speaking to people before I knew every speaker I had an anecdote about introducing them I had an anecdote about their session mm-hmm. I did the regular stand up that increased the value yeah. on the back of that there was an external speaker they got in uh, in the speaker's room we were bitching about the external speaker because that person wasn't really very good uh the head of learning and development invited me in to run corporate training for them that happened then what tends to happen is the nature of my work is that i meet a lot of senior people you know all my events are c level uh, right. events now because i'm a comedian i have no ulterior motive you know there's nothing i want from them so mm-hmm. their barriers are down yeah and we have a sort of friendly chatty sort of relationship yeah. it's very, very easy for me to get two people in the room who can help each other out mm-hmm. so then these guys said listen why don't you help us with business development Yeah. you know help us get in the right room with the right people right i mean literally within so the first time they said you know we may not show sure how this will work i said why don't you you know try it out mm-hmm. so the i got on a call with this guy at 4 o'clock and he said you know there's some company in this small town do you think uh, you might know somebody there i said let me figure it out right. uh within half an hour from that i had called somebody in that city by the evening i had we were in the managing director's office right mm-hmm. and they closed that deal two weeks after that which was a 5 crore deal Such you know true. so there are so many different ways that one can bring value yeah. so whenever somebody calls me for an event mm-hmm. i t- i ask them i said what is the event what is your objective what are the challenges you're facing because a lot of people know me in the capacity of a stand up comedian right. not realizing that i can do corporate training motivation speaking hosting interviewing moderating business development uh there's so much stuff that i can bring to the table very true very true yeah i love that i'm completely coming with the mindset of uh, not only a consultant but even like a sales guy who really goes out there and does his fact finding first because until you know everything about everything you're probably not going to go out there and do justice and 
very, very commendable that you actually get into that much detail because I think too many people today have an attitude of, Zoom pe to hai, we'll just go online and we'll wing it. And then it's it's sad because they haven't done justice, uh, you know, to you know anyone. I mean, the audience uh, themselves, their client, and that's just a pity. And I think, you know, just because you're online doesn't mean you need to have a different standard than you would if you would do this offline as well. And I think more and more people need to really realize that as well. In fact, recently I've put out this concept called a chief caffeine officer, you know, saying that sometimes you just need somebody to have a coffee with, mm. right? Because especially for the senior guys, it's very lonely at the top, right? Who do you talk about the challenges that you're facing? You know, you can't tell people at the office. You don't want to bring that at home because you're meant to be this, you know, rock and really senior person. Sure. But just about the challenges, about ideation, about anything. So yes. I'm the guy you call for, you know, coffee conversation and a boost, okay. you know, because whether it's ideation, whether it's coaching, whether it's just support or just venting, uh, I think there's a real need for that. Mm, yeah. I do like, you know, sense uh, you, know, you to be more of a, you know, a performing in-person kind of guy and, uh, you know, just you know, wanting to have, you know, human contact as well, being able to see how your audience is reacting. So how have the last 15 months been for you? I mean, have you been able to adapt to the virtual world and, you know, has it been a, a difficult, um, I mean, I hate the word, but pivot, uh, so to speak, you know, I hate the word pivot. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, all my life I've gone around telling people that stand-up comedy is a bit like sex, right? It's best enjoyed live and not in front of a screen. Mm -hmm. There's no substitute for actually being there. So if you're watching it on a screen, you're surfing comedy porn. Yeah. But much to my surprise, Gaurav, I have absolutely loved being a porn star, you know? And I figured out a way to do it and add immense value. Like I said, it's, it's helped me raise my game, the level of interaction, the level of customization, and the beauty is I can take this training and when the world does open again, I take it to the live shows as well. But I think it's all about a mindset, you know. And if you have the kind of mindset where change is constant, it's always going to come your way in one form or the other. Now, you can either look at it and say, ah, I wish things were the way they were. Mm -hmm. They're not. What are you going to do? Right? So if you don't adapt, uh, you're going to die or stagnate. So you've got to figure out a way to make things work. 100%. Oh, adapt or die completely. I mean, you can't, you know, be the same person that you were in a world that's constantly changing. I mean, that's what I always tell everyone. And uh, yeah, everyone thought that, you know, the first wave is gone. We're coming back to live. I was so happy. We have an academy and we say, hey, we're going to bring people back and we've kept the academy running all through. Uh, even yeah. though for the last 15 minutes, uh, 15 months, I've only had my digital team sitting in there putting out you know, stuff on Facebook. But yeah. We're not coming back for a few more months, but it's okay. I mean, but here's the bright side, Gaurav. Soon you're going to be an ed tech company and get billions of dollars from somebody who's going to pay you for all your losses. <laughs> <laughs> agree, agree. And, yeah, you must catch up for a coffee and, and drink to that. <laughs> sure. It doesn't have to be the caffeine, caffeine show. Yeah, so, sure. Do you recommend a career in stand-up to anyone who's contemplating the same? I would, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you love it, if you enjoy it, go for it. Yeah. And it's not like you're stuck with it. Yeah? You can do stand-up, you can do 10 things with it. You sure. know, I, I, would, I would recommend anything and everything, whatever floats your boat and helps you pay the bills. Uh, also keep in mind with every business, I mean, you, you want to feed the soul, but you have to feed the stomach as well. So there will be an element of prostitution. There are some things you will do to feed the stomach yeah. and they will finance you to do the things you want to do to feed the soul. Right. So, I mean, just like yourself, I mean, today, for example, you have a gift, a corporate gifting business. Your soul may, may not be in that. Right. But it feeds the stomach and allows you to, to do this stuff. You know, so it's I mean, Shah Rukh Khan dances at weddings. Mm. Who are we, man? Mm. <laughs> True. Yeah. True that. That. And do you think anyone can start a career in comedy at any point in their lives? Do you think there's uh, an yes. age barrier or can they do it? None whatsoever. Mm. In fact, the, the older you are, the, the better you will probably be because you just have so many more things to talk about. So true. So true. Yeah. Yeah. And your thoughts on the future of comedy in India? No thoughts, man. I mean, I, I think it's going to be great because the beauty about our country is that there is so much material, right? And no matter what kind of comedian you are, no matter what kind of a sense of humor you have, there is an audience for everyone. Yeah. You know, there is 
no right way there is just your way yeah. and whatever way that is you will find an audience for that so mm. yeah yeah i love that so you've always been big into collaboration in fact uh, you know frequently speaking uh, you know i would say the papa of every aspiring comedian that walked into a room in delhi like 15 years ago and uh, it's an interesting stand everyone thinks oh you know i'm creating competitors but even back then i mean you were thinking collaboration you were thinking mentorship um so interesting and and what were your thoughts that time when you actually started to take that path um i just wanted to create a safe space for the industry to grow you know comedy is a very difficult thing to do and if you get on stage and you have three bad gigs uh, you go home and cry and you never do it again you know so i wanted to be able to create a space where audience has understood that it's a difficult thing to do uh, if somebody misbehaved i put them down there are times where i have got an audience member on stage and said yeah you think it's so easy you fucking do it right and he struggled i've shut him up and sent him back but i just wanted to create that safe space for the art form to grow for comedians to grow so we could have a circuit and then it got to a point where people grew and started running their own gigs and then i wasn't sort of required to uh, you know play mother hen i suppose at some level uh and that was wonderful to see and like seriously you know when i come to think of it it truly seems like you know the life of a comedian where you say highly strung mostly losing money consuming unhealthy food um bad sleep i almost sounds like the life of a professional poker player because i think they go down the same route like it's just it's just it's a tough it's a tough tough option to really choose so yeah it get, it gets better yeah and i think the other uh, the other uh, you know simile that i actually drawn was um comedy um life and and golf you know you think you've got all figured out and you have like the best round or the best gig you know you say okay i've cracked this i mean tomorrow though i can take on the world and then you could get your ass handed to you you know like the next day right but you know it's a very good uh, it's a very good uh, comparison to make you know because and i think this is the trick to not just comedy and life and golf but really everything the mistake you make is that you start comparing yourself with others right the only person you need to be better than is yourself mm. you know and that's constantly going to be the game some days you'll have good days some days you'll have bad days and you also need to keep in mind that people grow at different rates and different paces you know sometimes you'll shoot ahead sometimes you'll slow down sometimes people who started way after you will go ahead uh in the way the world do, chooses to describe ahead mm. that's fine you know you can't be bitter about those things but you've just got to look at it through the lens of your own life and your own growth and i think that's the way you find joy through it otherwise you're always going to be uh, i mean if your sense of joy and achievement and comfort and everything else comes from outside if it if it's external you're going to be miserable all the time yeah. and this is what's happening now with all this social media we live in a in a world of external validation our yeah. sense of self worth is starting to come from how many likes how many shares oh i got so many likes so on what are you doing mm. you know you're giving the power of your happiness or your self worth to somebody else who's on a phone and doesn't really care you know and that's a big challenge yeah. very very valuable lesson uh, at least in today's time and not only the youth you know we sing it even uh, you know amongst I grew up even older people it's all about you know those many followers these many likes i think very very rightly said uh, the validation i think has to come from within and not externally and i think that's what some my mom was telling me all the way back since you know it's probably 5 and i'm like oh you know but i did better than that guy or that guy did worse than me and she like good stop she says what did what are you doing for yourself i don't want to know about anyone else it's just you versus you and hey brought that up again Appreciate that's it. why i came first in class gaurav and you didn't that's why i came <laughs> <laughs> even you were your junior so the thing is uh, yeah i think when i was at least i stopped studying after prep school anyway i think the the okay. one time i moved from delhi to sana and it was, everything was just so easy and i remember going the another friend of mine and, my, and like the day for the exam we were like you know making these paper planes and we we're flying them off our dormitory we were on top you guys were below yeah yeah we had the cut side had like i don't know how many thousands of planes and and when the exam happened i mean arjun gain came first but arjun gain was like smart like that and yeah. i came second and and they like but you were like flying planes and then you know uh, gobind almost almost flunked and i'm like dude maybe you should have been flying planes you know but yeah that was that was yeah. the good times so you truly don't hold back from calling you know a spade a spade and do you think sometimes that puts you in a bad spot and ends up you know burning some bridges because i sense that from the book a little bit i think i'm 
so here's the thing. You'll find that in the book as well, I have no problem calling a spade a spade largely when it comes to myself. Uh, even the bitter experiences I have had with other people, you will see that in the book as well. I'm not saying anything negative about them. Sure. I'm talking about this is what I felt like when I went through that experience. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's nice to hang on to that poison. You know, I mean, you just suffer within. Yeah. I think I, I don't know if it's a, I've seen a meme about it, probably Buddha who said it, that, you know, uh, he says, what holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You know, mm. so I don't think it's, uh, it makes sense to hang on to that. But, but yeah, you're right. I think often what happens is when people meet me the first time around, to some, I may come across as blunt. But after they meet me two or three times, they find it refreshing. Because they know this guy is not going to lie to you. He's not putting on a pretense. Right. It's not one of those page saying, oh, we must catch up. Yeah. You know, you're never going to catch up, right? If I say, let's grab a coffee, I mean, let's grab a coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, not one of the, mm, oh, it's so nice to see you. Right. And you then don't see them for five years, you know. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I think life is too short to just be inauthentic here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, certain certain things that really stood out for me in the book, uh, you know, one was... Um, the amount of positivity that you, you know, showcase, despite you know everything that's happened, something positive was definitely one. Uh, prankster was definitely another one. You really played a lot of pranks on on people, at least in the earlier days. I'm not sure if you're still doing that anymore or not. And um, also, I think um, the pursuit of perfection. I think you really you know set a really high standard and, and you went for it. And uh, I think when people and, and you mentioned this that when people told you that nahi ho sakta, you know there's nahi hoga, you know then you went out and, and went out even you know harder to just prove everyone wrong. So I think these are yeah. some some things that really uh, you know, uh, were screaming at me from the book. Let's just say absolutely right. The only thing I would amend now is not perfection but excellence. Yeah, uh, that's the only change I would make to that word. Uh, yeah. I agree. I always tell people, you know, it's not a good idea to be, uh, you know, striving for perfection because to my mind, I mean, perfection is a failing formula. And a lot of times I think it's, um, you know, people confuse uh, procrastination and perfection. They're like, oh, I need this to be perfect before I roll it out. Hell no, you're just being lazy, right? So yeah, I've, I've started telling people, even everyone I meet within the office, I'm like, stop, we don't need perfect. I think the thing is, yeah, there's two things. One is if you know you have done your best, that's that's good enough. Mm -hmm. And the other thing somebody told me very recently, actually, about doing business in India, he, he says it took me a long time to realize that good enough is good enough. Right? <laughs> a lot of your clients, for your clients, good enough is good enough. Mm -hmm. But you are thinking, no, no, it's got to be excellent. It's got to be perfect. It's got to be. But for them, they're like, boss, okay. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes. So, yeah. You send them to a Tony Robbins event where he's like, good is not good enough. Like it's like good will become like it'll just constantly deteriorate to becoming terrible. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, so chalta hai. So Yeah, no, I mean, see, I, I I may not still buy that, right? Because mm -hmm. the fact is the way we are built, you're still like, I know it may be good enough for you, but because mm -hmm. also you get to a point where you're like, this may be good enough for you, but if I'm putting a piece of work out, it's reflecting on my brand and what I stand for and what I deliver. So I'm really sorry if this is good enough for you, but it's not good enough for me. So I'm not going to give it to you. Yeah, yeah. So if I was to give you a time machine and said, hey, you can go back in time and you know, choose that one moment in your life, um, which one do you think that would probably be? I wouldn't. I don't buy into this stuff. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think there's a place in time. Every part of life plays its own part. Yeah. And it's for us to relish and cherish and enjoy. So I'm not a big one for time machines. Yeah. How the next uh, six to 12 months looking for you? What's in store for Papa CJ? Uh, I'm super, uh, very excited about the executive coaching stuff I'm doing. You know, I'm working with some really cool people, some really senior people. Okay. And it's wonderful to be able to work with people who can have a huge impact on the organizations they work with. You know, uh, so you're helping them. I mean, as a coach, your job is to open up different mental pathways. You know, we were speaking about this offline just a little while back. Mm -hmm. Often as an experienced pro professional, it is your expertise and knowledge that actually comes in the way. You know, whereas somebody like myself who comes to most industries completely from left field. I mean, here's a comedian. I mean, mm -hmm. I've just written an article uh, for Howard Business Review. 
but it's a comedian's perspective to how to approach communication in a very business context yeah. and you are able to show them or at least get them to explore lenses that they may not have before and that opens up these pathways which then they think oh yeah i could do this i could you know and a lot of coaching is just common sense yeah it's dealing with people you know the three things you try and change are uh, a hope will change as a part of your, uh, as a result of your intervention one is their vision you know how they look at things two is their behavior and three is the quality of their relationships you know that's uh, essentially it and also you've got to be able to uh, i think get them to dream you know everyone is too goal focused now you know now goals are really good when you want to focus but they don't encourage creativity they don't encourage new ideas new thinking new people you know and that kind of comes from dreams you know so you've got to be able to uh, help yeah. open that piece up yeah and and hence i think you know when goals and even vision boarding when the two go together because your vision board is, is truly fantasy is truly you know your dreams truly things like you you know the perfect life and the perfect everything and then you've got your goal your or your goal planner which is which is kind of you know real more reality i think the two together make for a pretty cool combination that's what i found as well possible yeah. so the happiness project i mean you mentioned a little bit about that but um i still going to be taking that forward and you know can listeners actually help with the cause because that truly is is uh, phenomenal i don't think listeners can necessarily help with the cause i mean uh, and it's not a it's not that i run some charity or it's it's just me doing different initiatives you know my approach to the happiness project is like the story of that little boy walking on the beach with his father and he keeps throwing these fish back in the ocean and his dad says you know you can't save all the fish he said yes but i can save these ones so i think it's for us to do what we can within our capacity to make whatever impact we can around those you know who uh, whose paths cross our way yeah agreed that's one of my favorite stories as well so yeah it's cool that you would actually bring that up so your advice and just concluding couple of questions because i know we're heading towards almost an hour now on recording and i know you had another engagement as well so your advice uh, you know to the youth of today and actually just people in general who are, who are struggling right they can't really come to terms with what's really happening they're feeling quite smashed they're feeling quite bashed you know yet not dashed um, well, i have to put that in there because that's well the done well done my friend very <laughs> slick indeed <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean you know your advice to to just people in general who are not in the best of spaces right now i find that the greatest way to feel uplifted or positive or better about your future and things that are going to happen for you is to uplift somebody else help somebody else i strongly believe in in karma or leadership by karma if you can make an effort to help other people get them to feel better improve their lives without expectation of return it is going to come back to you multifold people will look for opportunities to try and help you and make your life better so i strongly believe in that and if i was to give one piece of advice i would give that you know be kind to people respect their time show them uh, you know treat them with dignity and what else can one ask for yeah just be a good human being Yeah, thank you for that. And and again, so so true. I mean, you keep it simple, right? You're not you're not beating around the bush. There are no complicated answers with you. It's it's just out there and it's, it's simple and it's it's relatable and yeah, I think that really is uh, again, you know, what the world really really needs. Uh, people just make things too complex. I've actually asked my designation to be changed. I'm like, can I just be the chief simplification officer? Right? Because I just think people make things too too complex and also- But simplification is too long a word, Gaurav. You need a shorter word for that. <laughs> C S O, and when they ask for it, then I'll give them the, the feedback. What it means. So, I mean, like I said, exceptional. Really appreciate this talk. Um, concluding question: How would you really want to be remembered? You know, what is really going to be Papa CJ's legacy? With a smile. that's it if you can if a smile comes to your face when you remember me that's good enough for me seriously awesome so i truly respect man i mean i told my dad about the mr beasting story and how you really stood up and my dad's a scenarian as well and you know when he heard about what you did and how you you know stood up for that and he'd been his house master as well and of course had been our deputy head master and dad was like you know R E S P E C T. So I mean, you know, I really want to end with that. Like respect, man. Like really appreciate you. A, of course, you know, for us taking out the time, you know, to being here, 
and uh, we could have definitely gone on for much longer. I mean, I'm sure there were so many more questions that we could have actually spoken about. But thank you so much for taking out the time. And a big shout out to your folks, um, your dad in particular. And I see a lot of the, you know, the in in the book how you mentioned about how close you know he is to you and your best friend, almost yeah. like my dad as well. So big shout out to him and thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Nice. Thanks for having me, Gaurav. Happy to come back anytime you have more questions. And my regards to your family as well. <laughs>